I was introduced to the 7th generation Forza Motorsport games in 2010 with Forza Motorsport 3. I thought Forza 3 was one of the best games that I had ever played at the time. I liked the physics, graphics, car list, track list, car customization, and the online gameplay, which I didn't mention in the review. I recommended Forza Motorsport 3 as it's sort of the beginning of the modern Forza games, and it's interesting to see how things have progressed in the 13 years since it was released. Two years later, Turn 10 Studios and Microsoft Studios one-upped not just themselves, but also Polyphony Digital and Sony Computer Entertainment as well, when they released Forza Motorsport 4 on the Xbox 360 in October 2011. I normally don't talk about intros to games, but I will make an exception here, as the intro to Forza Motorsport 4 isn't just the usual montage of racing, it's a fast-paced music. Instead, the game has a monologue by Jeremy Clarkson, who talks about the petrol head being an endangered species. This being 2011, new cars were more about economy rather than speed and power. More and more manufacturers were downsizing engines, making hybrids, and developing electric cars as restrictions on emissions were getting tighter in countries all around the world. And as we get closer to the sale of the internal combustion engine being banned, what Jeremy says gets more and more real with each passing year. There is a haven. A place that celebrates speed, grip, gears and fun. And it's all here for you to explore. You start Forza Motorsport 4 in a race driving the Ferrari 458 Italia on the fictional Bernese Alps racetrack, just so you can get used to the physics. But that race is also used for you to know where your skill level is at before you get into the career mode. Most games at this point had a race like this at the beginning, but Forza Motorsport 4 is a bit different to other racing games as it leaves auto braking on. I get that it's all about inclusivity and it helps players who aren't good at games or aren't into cars, but it gets to a point where a game is boring if you don't have a challenge. And if you don't have an interest in cars whatsoever, then I don't see the point in playing a racing game in the first place. Once you've finished the tutorial race, then you'll get a choice of a few very low powered cars. It's just like the third game, but in Forza Motorsport 4, the cars are even less powerful. This is something that the more modern Forza games are missing, and it's one of the main criticisms that the game's player base has about the Xbox One Forza titles. Even as soon as Forza Motorsport 5, two years later, the game gave you cars that were about three times more powerful than the cars that you get at the beginning of Forza Motorsport 4. Once you get into the game, then you have two ways of playing the career mode. One way of playing through the game is selecting races through World Tour. This game mode is basically seasonal play from Forza Motorsport 3, so the game will show you races that your current car is eligible to enter. I find the World Tour quite boring. I want to be given a proper choice when it comes to what events to drive in. I only did a few of the events through the World Tour, just so I could form an opinion of it and get gameplay footage for this review. One of the incentives to play through World Tour is that you get a lot of achievements. I don't really see the point in playing through World Tour just for a few extra achievements as I'm not an achievement hunter and I find that the people who are, are a little bit strange. For some reason the game calls it World Tour but the Xbox calls it seasonal play in the achievements. To me the event list is a much better way of playing through the game. The event list has every single event that you have to do to be able to complete 100% of the game, and it's all displayed in one menu. The events are split up into six categories. You have the European manufacturer, Asian manufacturer, and North American manufacturer races. These events are just one model, one manufacturer events, and events that only include cars from a certain country. But you've also got manufacturer versus manufacturer events, 
such as the Audi vs BMW Coupe Challenge. And you've also got model vs model events like the Mustang vs Camaro Challenge. These events are very easy and because of that you don't earn that much money for doing them, but it is a good place to start. For more money you'll have to get into the semi-pro races and international masters events. Here you have the body style, drivetrain, European, Asian, North American races and the international masters, which are just like the European, Asian and North American races at the beginning of the game, but a bit longer. I hope you all managed to follow that because I barely can and I wrote the script. The difficulty is a little bit harder than it is in the events in the first three categories. I used these events to build up my car collection by making my way through the levels and earning credits for the cars that the game doesn't give you a choice of when you level up. It's also a good and quick way to bring up your affinity level, which I'll talk more about in a minute. The one issue that I have with this category is that the races are all on the same tracks with a few different ones scattered about in various places. So you'll spend over 30 hours of the game racing in the same 10 or so locations, and that does get a bit boring. Luckily, the same can't be said for the second to last category that I'm going to talk about. I don't know what to call this category as all of the events that it has seem to be events that the developers couldn't put anywhere else but there are eight event types and there are 10 events of each type, which does mean that there are 80 events overall in this category. Well, 79 if you didn't download the DLC for the F10 M5 sedan challenge. I am going to talk about every single type of event in this category, except for the Top Gear challenge, which I'll talk more about in a minute. Multi-class events are races that have cars that are in different classes, but the cars that are in the other class are not your opponents. You've basically got two races on the same track at the same time. When I first played Forza, I thought this was weird, but then I realized that this happens in real life racing. There's also professional multi-class events as well. The only noticeable difference between the two is that the game will only put you up against race cars in the professional multi-class events, as it's all R3 to R1 class, whilst the normal multi-class events are F to S class. There's also the Fujimi 1 vs 1 Mountain Chase, Track Days and Nürburgring 1 vs 1 Challenge events, which are all overtaking challenges. The Fujimi 1 vs 1 Mountain Chase and Nürburgring 1 vs 1 Challenge events have you trying to beat one other opponent in a point to point race whilst having to overtake lower class cars. The lower class cars don't have anything to do with you winning, but they do in the track day events. The track day events are all about overtaking the slower cars. You have to overtake a certain number of cars within two or three laps of a track. If you don't overtake the required number of cars, then you'll fail and have to redo it. This game mode is very reminiscent of a game mode in the Project Gotham Racing series, which was no longer around by the time Forza Motorsport 4 was released. But it's not the only game mode that has been used in the Project Gotham Racing games. Autocross is a game mode where you have to do a lap of a track in under a certain time whilst driving through cone gates, which are scattered around the track. If you crash into a cone, then the game will add 5 seconds to your time. And then finally we get to the Super Speedway series. There's not much to say for these events except they're like normal races that you get in the other categories, but on speedways. I really like these events and it's a nice break from doing race after race on the same tracks in the same cars, but it does go back to the same kind of races in the last category, which is the World Championships. There are 10 World Championships in total, there's almost one for every car class that is in the game except for X class, so from F class all the way up to R1. 
This is the most boring part of the game, and I know I'm sounding very negative here, but here's why I think this. Just like the events in the semi-pro and international masters, a lot of the tracks used are the same, but there are a few more as you go through the championships. The championships get longer and longer, even though you end up driving cars that are the fastest in the whole game. To make things worse, every event has two heats, so you have to do the same event twice for the game to count it as being completed. If you exit the event in the first heat, then you'll have to do it again. Even though the races can get repetitive every now and then, overall they are a lot of fun. Like I said when I talked about the semi-pro races and international masters events, the problem is that a lot of the tracks are used too often, and with the longer races in the later parts of the game, it becomes more of an issue. Unlike other games such as the early 2010s Need for Speeds and Gran Turismo 5, Forza Motorsport 4 tries to get you driving as many cars that the game has to offer, and that doesn't really carry on into the Xbox One Forza titles. This shows how well thought out Forza Motorsport 4's career mode is, and I hope Turn 10 Studios uses what makes the racing great in this game for the new Forza Motorsport being released later this year. One of the things that keeps me doing race after race for hours on end is the leveling up system. There are two sides to the leveling up system, just like in the previous games, but Turn 10 Studios changed a few things. You have level 1 to 50 where you win cars, and you get a small cash prize for going up any level past 50. You have a choice of cars when you go up a level. I usually chose the cars that are the most expensive, just so I didn't have to waste money when collecting all 500 or so. The affinity levels go up the more you use cars from a manufacturer. As you go up a level, you get a small cash prize, and that will go up and up. But you also get 100% off all upgrades for all cars made by that manufacturer by level 4. I say all upgrades, but you do need to pay full price for the conversion stuff, so engine swaps, drivetrain swaps, and aspiration conversions. I really like this idea, but it does make the game a bit too easy, as you can turn one of the slowest cars in the game into one of the fastest for something like 15,000 credits after only 5 races or so. I think it would have been better to slow the progression of the affinity levels or have the affinity levels linked to each car, not manufacturer. Affinity levels wasn't the only new feature to the series, as there is a completely new feature that is still in the series to this day, even though now it isn't as good. And that is Auto Vista. Auto Vista is a detailed showcase of a few of the cars that are in the game, and two which aren't drivable, which are the Bentley 8 litre and the Warthog from the Halo series. But they are only unlocked once you've unlocked other cars in this feature. To unlock cars you have to do different events, such as a race, the Top Gear Challenge, which again I'll talk more about in a minute, or a Track Day event. Once you've unlocked a car, you can walk around it, start the engine, and open the doors. This is something that you can do in all of the Xbox One Forza games, except Horizon 2. But the one thing that the Auto Vista in this game has, which the others don't, is a short summary of each car that was written and narrated by Jeremy Clarkson. It's a strange time warp for people who believe cars should come with built-in nostalgia and a special kind of hat. And if that hasn't put you off the Aero Supersports, you should know that there's also a version with a fixed roof, one of which is owned by Richard Hammond. The idiot. I really like the Auto Vista in this game, but it would have been nice if the developers included more of other types of cars that aren't supercars, such as hot hatches, SUVs, and more cars from the 80s and 90s. This feature has a lot of association with Top Gear, but if you look in the right places, 
then you'll see that the rest of the game has a lot of Top Gear references as well. First of all, you have the Top Gear challenges, which I'm finally getting round to talking about. In the Top Gear challenges, you have to do a loop of the Top Gear test track whilst knocking over as many oversized bowling pins as you possibly can. And you get points depending on how many you knock over. Some of the pins are painted gold, and those ones are worth more points. The Top Gear references continue in the car list as well as the first and third reasonably priced cars, the Suzuki Liana and the Kia Seed, are also in the game. Chevrolet probably didn't want the Lissetti in the game at all, seeing as there's nothing special about it whatsoever, and Top Gear buried it under a demolished chimney. As Turn 10 Studios had the Top Gear license, I do think they could have gone a little bit further with the challenges and the car list, such as adding the limos, the camper vans, and both of the Toyota Hiluxes from the show. But what is in the game is quite substantial, especially when you consider that no game released before Forza Motorsport 4 had anything like this. It is advertising, but it's advertising done right. The BBC wouldn't claim it as advertisement, but that is clearly what it is. This is the best looking Xbox 360 game. It is so good looking graphically that I had to change the motherboard and CPU in my computer to get the footage to look as good as it does on the TV. Forza Motorsport 4 has also got the best physics compared to every other racing game on the Xbox 360. The main reason for this was because Turn 10 Studios focused on tyres and how they deform when a car goes round corners at speed. And that would have had the biggest effect as the tyres are what connects the car to the track. Speaking of tracks, Forza Motorsport 4 has tracks in 26 locations, which is only 3 locations less than Gran Turismo 5. Not bad for a game in a franchise which at that point was only 6 years old. The tracks are all amazing, especially when you compare them to the tracks in Gran Turismo 5. You have the tracks that you would normally find in a Forza game such as Laguna Seca, Silverstone, Fujimi Kaido and Sebring International Raceway, but there were a few new tracks added, like Hockenheim Ring, Indianapolis Motor Speedway and Infineon Raceway. I cannot fault the way the tracks look at all. The amount of detail that the developers put into each and every one of them to make them look like that they were actually used is insane. That is something that Turn 10 Studios is still good at to this day. They also put a lot of detail into the cars. Forza Motorsport 4 has 500 cars which were all made for the Xbox 360 Forza games. So some were originally made for Forza Motorsport 2 and some were made for Forza Motorsport 3, but none were made for the first game on the original Xbox. I know some of you will know why I pointed that out. Forza Motorsport 4 has the most diverse car list that the series had ever had up until that point, and to an extent it's more diverse than the car lists in the later games. They say variety is the spice of life, and so Forza Motorsport 4's car list must be a jalapeno, as even though you have little city cars such as the Toyota Igo and the Citroen C1, to sports cars and supercars along with SUVs and pickup trucks, it's missing some of the more oddball stuff that the series is now known for. There are a lot of cars in this game that never returned to the series like the Toyota Prius, Volkswagen Fox, and the Nissan Leaf, which I know a lot of people don't care about, but it adds to the variety. There were a lot of DLC cars too, but you can't buy them anymore, which is a shame as there were some really good car packs, which included cars such as the Ford Transit, the 90s Aston Martin V8 Vantage, and the Alfa Romeo GTV6. Most of the DLC cars were new to the series. In fact, I think only one DLC car had been in the series before the release of Forza Motorsport 4. And that is something that I do miss about the Forza games now. 
the car assets look good. Not Gran Turismo 5 premium cars good, but good. And the quality of the car assets are consistent throughout the game. The cars do sound better in this game than in any other racing game that was released at around the same time. Especially when you upgrade them. The car upgrading is the same as it was in the last game, and that's not a bad thing at all. So you can add more power with engine modifications, upgrade your brakes, suspension, tires, do weight reduction, do engine swaps, drivetrain conversions, and you can add a turbo or supercharger. Forza Motorsport 4 gave the player more freedom when it came to car upgrading than any other game that was out at the time, even more than the need for speeds. It's like what I said a few minutes ago, you can turn one of the slowest cars in the game into one of the fastest. You can make a Toyota Prius go fast as you've also got electric motor upgrades. You don't get much more power out of the electric motor upgrades, but it's nice to have the option, especially when you also have the engine upgrades, which makes one hell of a fast but ugly car. You can try to make it look a little bit better with the visual customization. Just like a plastic surgery and tattoo parlor combined, Forza Motorsport 4 gives you a lot of body modification options. They are mainly for the Japanese cars that are in the game, but there are a few from outside of Japan that also have a few body mods. Not many, but more than there were in the previous game. You can also add decals, which a lot of games of this type still didn't have in 2011. Like, sure, you had games such as Midnight Club LA and Test Drive Unlimited, which allowed the player to add decals, but those were open world arcade racers. Games such as Gran Turismo 5 still had no option for it. Turn 10 Studios didn't add anything new to the livery editor, which is pretty much the same as it was in Forza Motorsport 3, but they didn't need to, as that game had the best livery editor at the time. A lot of people consider Forza Motorsport 4 not just the best Forza Motorsport game, but the best racing game of all time, and I can see why. No other racing game on the Xbox 360 had a car list this varied, but the developers should have spread the tracks out a little bit more in the career mode, which at times does get a bit boring, and it's not just a case of a lack of tracks, as the game does have a brilliant track selection, but at this point in the franchise's life it should have had rally and other types of off-road racing. Forza Motorsport 4 is what I want the next Forza Motorsport game to be like, as none of the Xbox One titles are this good, and neither was the game's main competitor, Gran Turismo 5, which I have mentioned a lot in this review, as it was Forza 4's only real competition. This was, to a lot of people, the peak of the Forza Motorsport franchise, and I do agree with that completely as all of the succeeding games didn't have that spark that made this game so great. With all of that being said, I do still think Gran Turismo 2 is the greatest game of all time, but this is definitely up there in my top 3. This has been my review of Forza Motorsport 4 on the Xbox 360. I've been working on this video on and off for the past year or so, and I'm so glad it's finally done. If you liked this review then please give it a like, if you didn't then that's your problem, and if you want to see more then please consider subscribing. Thank you for watching, and goodbye.